So, uh, welcome to the live. Uh, my name is Dan Bileman. Um, I don't think we need to turn them all off. You press down and just give it a second, it's a small blade. Alright. Okay. Uh, so, in lieu of our um, other presentation, uh, we'll be just doing kind of a bunch of different things. Um, I'd like to show you guys some more advanced uh, screen usage, uh, how to spawn uh, game servers uh, using scripts, screen, restarting, things like that. Um, a neat bash thing I found out today. Uh, I'll go ahead and do some containers too, how to build <laughs> Docker stuff. And um, then we, if we want to do an install of a LAMP stack, we can try that, but I don't want to really step over the other presentation because I imagine we will be having that one just later on. Uh, is this a token? Just your eyes. Okay. It, it might just be blind. It's kind of skewed. It, it's well, a little I mean, blurry. It, that's what you're going to get. Yeah. <laughs> that I, uh, I wrote for my game servers. Uh, Will you get in jail if you do modify anything on the servers with Minecraft? <laughs> like, What's that? I mean, I don't want to be put in jail for anything modified on like a live game or anything like that. I don't know. Like, well, we're what, not, what are the repercussions of doing that? Yeah, what are the repercussions? <laughs> I'm running your own server? I'm trying not oh, to get do, like, to do jail. Do you have permission of the owner of the server? No. Okay, so so what is, what's what, what is your question like what's specific there? Yes, I can. Okay. Do whatever you want on the server you're yeah. in. Yeah. Like, like this, the, all okay. of this is everything that I'm showing you is 100 percent legal. <laughs> 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 what did I do for my uh, talk in November on how to start a Minecraft server using AWS? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna do that. Yeah. Okay. It'll be on YouTube. Okay. That that's uh, that's a really good presentation to get the whole gambit. This is gonna be a real quickie. So if it's this, you know, this tickles your 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 sure. enjoyment. Uh, no, actually, this is one I just rewrote, but I, yeah, I, I did write this for Jack Sacks, and that's kind of the code's kind of lived on. Um, yeah, the old ticket kit. <laughs> Where, where's your code? Oh, that's oh there's the code. Oh, mucho yeah. better for us yeah. blind people. Is everybody see it all right? Are you sure? I mean, are you sharing the code? Like, uh, GitHub or something? Like it's right there. No. <laughs> take, a picture, take a picture with your phone. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I can, if you would like, I mean, this is just for my personal server. And Siri, if you'd run like the time picture. It, then I can certainly provide it to you. I'll replay it on um, Jack's logged out. Hmm? I'll replay it on Jack's logged yeah. out now. Uh, somebody remind me when we're Git Hub or something uh, like that. And I'll try to put it up there. I'm really bad about that. I don't know if you guys know this. <laughs> uh, so the first. The first one is uh, where you would just take the server, which is uh, this techit.jar, and you download it off of the internet. So you grab the you grab the server, and it comes down as a either an executable in a .exe or a Java file or a jar. Uh, I'm running Linux, so Java. Um, Windows, I don't know. Uh, this certainly wouldn't work for Windows. Uh, there may be different ways of optimizing and doing different things. So this is a just a giant single command, and I'll walk through it and tell you what it all does, yeah, assuming I remember what the flags did. All right, so the screen <laughs> is a great program that allows you to disconnect your running session and run a live session that you're not on anymore. So you can type screen, do something, exit the screen session, it's still running, and then you can exit the server and you won't lose what you were doing. Not attached to a shell. Right. And you can also do all kinds of cool stuff like splitting the screen into parts and uh, you know mirroring things and do it. There's all kinds of cool screen usage. Um, DMS. Uh, S is the name of the container. I'm naming it Tekkit. Uh, D, I believe, means to detach immediately. So it runs the command and then detaches itself. And I forgot what M is. But, you know what we can do? Mm. <laughs> All right. Man, 
Landing pages, the best and most useful things. So we just go down and we can say like, all right, what, it's always, it pretty much is always in order. So dash D dash M, start a screen in detached mode to create a new session, but doesn't attach to it. This is useful for system startup scripts. Uh, dash M on its own causes screen to ignore the uh, serial terminal environment. Actually, that's not serial terminal environment. I'm not sure what ST was. Um, Variable with the screen dash and creation of a new session is enforced regardless whether a screen is called within another screen session or not. This flag has special meaning in connection to the dash D option, which is what we did here. Uh, and also, really remember Linux is case sensitive. Windows is not case sensitive. Cases matter. Example dash D dash M, dash D dash M. They're different. <laughs> so, anybody that's coming from the Windows world. Make sure that you're on top of that. Okay, uh, so we're going to go back and look at our script again. All right, so we have detach, and we have name, and then I'm going to run a command. Now, you could just stop here for screen. You could just stop right there, and it would start it, it start a little screen session. It would detach from it, and it would just be floating there doing nothing. Okay, but I want it to actually run something. I want to start a game server. So this is a script. I, I named it techit.sh. I run that script, and it just starts the server in the background. I don't have to interact with it anymore. Um, so it does bash dash C. The dash C runs a command. Okay. So it allows me to run a command that's encapsulated within ticks and stuff to uh, be able to pass all my variables and anything that I want. Uh, then I CD into the directory that I'm trying to run it from. Then I start the server. This from here to here is one command. It's really big. All right. And so what I what I want? Yes, yeah, Java. Everything's bigger in Java. Uh, <laughs> so what I'd like to do is I want to optimize it for the server I'm running. All right. So I want to have big worlds. It's got lots of mods running on it. It needs a lot of memory. It needs a lot of horsepower. I want to tune it the best I can. And uh, since I used to run Blackboard, I got a lot of tuning. Um, experience in Java. Uh, and so I'm running a server. I'm running it where the minimum and the maximum memory allocation is 12 gigs. What that does, now this yeah, server I run it on one. We used to play this in the makerspace, so, so we had a lot of people playing on it. And yeah. The worst part about that was, <coughs> it's also tech it. That was the miscraft mod because that kept spawning other worlds. Right. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, so it would stack up and use all that memory. Now, I have a 32 gig machine that this thing's running on. Uh, so 12 gigs is, like, if I'm using this as one of the primary things on this machine, that's great. You know, 12 gigs is fine. There's plenty of space. I can maybe run two of these, no problem. Um, or I can scale it down and try to run more. The reason that you set small and max the same is Java tries to get to the small. It will use up to the max. But it will be aggressive in its garbage collection and its dumping of material out of memory if you set the small number lower. Okay. The reason you want to set them generally the same amount is you, if you're doing server planning, if you want to, if we want to talk about servers, I have a 32 gig machine. I want it to be predictable how much memory, how much I/O, how much CPU I'm using, and I want to plan for what I'm building. Okay. So in this case, I am planning that I'm going to use 12 gigs of my memory on this server for this process. Okay? Not only does it help the process itself, because it doesn't have to be sitting there discarding a lot of uh, material out of the memory, but it also helps the uh, processor too, because it doesn't have to be actively looking for things to take and throw out. Then we have our perm size over here which is, starts here, the dash x, and it keeps going over here. Uh, our perm size is one of the, uh, one of the three sizes in, uh, in Java. Or here's perm, it's been so long. I think it's perm, old, and new, or something like that. Uh, but you can set the perm size. It's usually very small, and I wanted it to be larger so that it would keep more material. Uh, I have not looked at this code in a long time, so I, I don't remember what D64 does. Anybody know? Uh, well, I mean, we got, we got man pages. 64-bit machine. 
D64, see? Look. Yes. Boom. Uh, also, in the man page, if you do slash and type something, it searches for it. I'm not entirely retarded. That's cool. mm -hmm. Right, runs the application in <laughs> the 64-bit environment. There you go. <laughs> knows what he's talking about. <coughs> All right. Uh, then we do uh, use par new GC, which we can go look up. Uh, I think that's the, uh, it's a parallel new garbage collection method, I think. So all, most all the Java apps that use default, which is everybody, are going to die in 2038 when the clock turns over. Uh, the EPUB. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe. I'm sure. I'm sure we'll we'll have something with that. Uh, so there's there's different types of garbage collection you can actually use in Java, and so depending on your application and depending on what kind of pauses you want, because to do a garbage collection, it stops the process. It then does a garbage collection, and then it starts the process again. And if you have a very heavily needed, heavy, heavily used um, application, such as like uh, a large institution's uh, learning management system, or you know anything like that, you need to know how your garbage collection is working and what kind of performance it's going to do. And so you can actually choose. The method of garbage collection, they have several methods, and I was using uh, the parallel, or actually I was using par. So here's parallel garbage collection, which uses more threads to, prefer, uh, to get the performance up. Uh, there's the old version, uh, which does full garbage collections, which takes a lot of time, but it's thorough. Um, and then there's the par new one, which enables parallel threads uh, in the young generation, but I believe on the older generation it uses the old method. So, again, man pages, they do stuff. Um, I'll just kind of mull over the rest of the, or most of the rest of these, because, I mean, we're not, probably, unless you guys are really enjoying the Java, like how to tune Java. No? Okay. What's a heap? What's a heap? Uh, heap is your memory. Um, Specifically, it's dynamically allocated memory. Uh, so you're, you have ratios. Uh, remember I was telling you about the three pools of memory? Those are three different heaps. And it, you have different, I believe, it, it, you have different sizes. And you can tune those, be bigger or smaller, depending on your application itself. And so if your application likes having uh, the new area to pull new variables in, it needs to have stuff that's very fresh, but it needs a lot of space for it. You can tune that where the new is very big. And that's actually... Most of the time, I think what happens is most of the time your new is huge, your medium is a lot smaller, and your old is tiny. Um, and because it doesn't want to keep a lot of stuff for a really long time. Uh, and you can tune that, all that stuff. And you can do it by like ratios. Um, you can uh, do it by specific sizes, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, CMS class unloading, I turned that on. Uh, parallel GC threads. So I told it to actually do two. Um, processing threads to do its garbage collections. And then my ratios of heap uh, for min and max. And then jar tells me which Java I'm, I'm gonna, or which jar. It's, it's saying that it wants to use a Java archive to spawn the thing. And th that's what jar means, it's Java archive. It's actually basically a tarball or a, a zip, and you can unzip it. So if you want to know what's inside of a jar, just unzip it, and it explodes. Um, Lots of files. Java developers like new files. Oh yeah, they do. Uh, and then know the UI because TechIt will, by default, so let's say that I wanted to run TechIt or Minecraft and I had a jar file and I'm running it on a Linux box and I just run the jar, it's going to run as a client because you want to play Minecraft. No, I want to make a server. So I tell it no GUI. Don't spawn a GUI. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So we run that. Now we have a server. Server's running. If you want to know more about configuring it or anything like that, check out his presentation. It's got all kinds of cool stuff. YouTube. All right. So now Java has this interesting thing where the longer it runs, the less stable it is. <laughs> Why is that? Uh, I don't know. It's been kind of a running theme with Java. 
You notice how there were three different garbage collection methods? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, eventually it just kind of runs out of memory. Yeah. So here what I'm doing is I have a, a script called Ticket Cycle, right? And what that thing does is every, let's say every night at 3 o'clock in the morning, because I'm not up, and if you're up playing it, well, then too bad. Uh, <laughs> I want to restart the server to get the, keep the performance up. I want to clear out all of the memory. I want to make sure there's no, like, because it's not just Java. It's their coding, too. So, like, if Minecraft is coded poorly or some, whatever application is coded poorly, and it says, hey, I really want to keep this memory thing, Java's going to be like, okay, and it's going to keep it. Or it's going to have, like, a, a bug that has a runaway memory leak or some, something is up, and Java is not designed to just handle that. It does it a little bit, but shouldn't yeah. your applications be programmed so that they don't produce garbage? Period. <laughs> I mean, in a perfect world, yes. Okay. But actually, that's a problem if you produce an app that doesn't produce garbage. <laughs> right. so oh, it's yes. like Minecraft, and you're just <laughs> infinitely spawning objects and never freeing them. That's, yeah, just, that's not producing any garbage. <laughs> I'd like to use this memory allocation. You're also table. looking at an application that's going to go unstable very quickly. Yeah, yeah it's a memory leak. Yeah, that's that is. That's a when you. Leak. That's yeah. That's it's when when it when it allocates a memory block and then forgets about it. <laughs> and it allocates a memory block and then forgets about it. That is garbage, but it's not garbage as far as the garbage collector can see it. Yeah, you're the garbage using collector it. says, "Hey, you're not using this. Let me tell the kernel it can have that memory back." Okay. But you have to free the object before you can do that. Right. So mm -hmm. if the program is using the memory. I think all of it. Turn the lights all off. That's bad. <laughs> Um, and that's all in the programming stuff. So, uh, so this, I want to restart the program because it's not just Minecraft, it's not just Java, but we have a lot of people that are making mods, we have a bunch of different people that are manipulating the code, and they might not be uh, professional coders, in fact they probably aren't, and this is how they're learning. And so they're going to have bad code that does cool stuff. <laughs> no, it's serious. Like that's the way a lot of code works. That's the way a lot of open source works. Is I made something. It's neat. Mm. It's neat. It's very badly coded, but it's neat. It ruins my server, but it works. Right. And so, like, you get a lot of that in different code bases. And one of the nice things about open source is I can be like, I made a thing. It's really cool. And then he can be like, Hey, how about you don't do the for loop by just going using a go to. Like, <laughs> you know, I'll change a case statement here instead of 90 if statements nested. Right. You know, it's simple things. <laughs> but that's how we grow and learn, and that's one of the advantages of an open source community, and that's why we like to have everybody be friendly and nice. Don't be jerks. Um, so here, I have this program that is somewhat buggy, but runs okay for a day, and I want to restart it every day at a low usage time. I can figure out my low usage time by using various methods like SAR or uh, system accounting, different things. But I've determined that 4 a.m. every morning, I want this thing to restart. But I don't want to just restart it. So if somebody is on the server, I don't want them to be like, hey, this is pretty cool. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> right? That's, that's really not nice. And so what I do is I give people a warning. And I do this by manipulating the screen. Now, what's really funny is X stuff is actually, that's a, that's a, that's a command. <laughs> that's not something I just came up with. <laughs> and so screen, I tell screen, the Tekkit container, I want to send it stuff, and I want to send it this. Okay? And so I say, now, my, this is actually Minecraft server uh, material right here. All right, so I punch into the Minecraft server or the screen session, and I literally just dump into it, and I say, "Say, restarting server in five minutes." Echo, uh, no, no return and um, uh, extra, e yeah, extra slash r, which is a return character because it wouldn't actually send a return character. Oh yeah. So I had to basically kind of hack a return character in there. Yeah. So um, j j just to just to visualize this, if you didn't run this inside a screen in a detached session, you would have a console where you can enter commands and tell the Minecraft to, to do things. You can create blocks, you can destroy blocks, you can kill characters, you can kick them out of the game, you can tell them things, and then you can promote c 
characters to be able to run their own commands or demo. You can do whatever you want inside the game from that console. Is it just yeah. written from an SPDM? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Have you ever tried to pipe you random into it? <laughs> Actually, I, I, I think that would just mess the server up. I don't think it would do. I mean, it would be yeah, that's what see what happens. Yeah. Try. Um, so, I, what I do is I say five minutes, and then I sleep for sixty seconds, and then I say four minutes, and then I sleep for sixty seconds. I keep doing that. All right. And then I get down to here, and then I say in one minute. Right. So these people see this on their screen every time I do this. It's going in the chat box. Well. Yeah, it's going in the little chat box, which everybody sees, and it's actually pretty prominent. What does it say as the user? Does it say server? Or? It says server. Okay. Yeah, server and then but, um, and so you know it's from the server. Well, I mean, you suppose it's from the server. And then uh, after a minute, I say sleep for 50 seconds, and then I say it's going to restart in 10 seconds. Uh, and then apparently I do that twice a couple of times. That's a, that's a bug, you see. <laughs> feature. It's not a bug, it's a feature. Right. I warned you twice about this. <laughs> I have another Damn. line that says, I told you yeah. 15 times. What are you talking about? Get off this thing, fool. <laughs> yeah, could, have a yeah, couldn't you yes. just like, you know, you're, you're restarting the server even if the player is there, but wouldn't there be a way to query the server and, and find sure. out if there's a player? Yeah, you could, you could go have query the server. Reboots the server. I, just, <laughs> I just wanted to put a warning out there. Well, so, well, then he gets a real-time notification on his phone because he kicked some player out when he was in the middle of something. Yeah, and I, I got an angry letter. Get an angry text. Get an angry text. Here's concern. Right. <laughs> so 10 seconds, 5 seconds, and I sleep one each time. See, this is where you could use a for loop. Yeah, I could. Uh, but you were probably so coding this at like 2 a.m. in the morning in the hacker space. So yeah, like, whatever. Yeah, I just, that's, that's kind of literally what happened. I'm just like, ah, time. Copy, paste, copy, paste. Copy, paste. Okay. So, and then here, I tell the server to terminate. Alright, so they get one second, and then one second later, it dies. Alright, so I go to the server, and I say, stop. And that's how you clear the server, by the way. Yeah. Uh, now, I could kill it, but that's really nasty, and it's not good for uh, code, and it's not good for like memory cleanup and stuff like that. So, yeah, I could do that, and then what I did is I actually just hard-coded the new uh, run, like you saw up there above. Mm -hmm. I could have called the other script. Uh, as well. I, I did code this like five years ago, so... Yeah. <laughs> and, like I said, probably at 2 a.m. in the morning at the hacker's space, right. if you were exhausted. Right, yeah, this is like, I'm making something work. <laughs> you did this because you probably, I, if I remember correctly, you got too many complaints about the server being unstable. Yes! And you're I like, I'm creating a cron job for this. <laughs> yes! So that's actually, yes, that's actually what it was. Yeah, yes. I remember that. Yeah. So it, it, we had stability issues because Java and all these little mods and Minecraft are not 100% stable when we have like six or eight people just I'm gonna run that way for how long? Well, I got the weekend off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not stopping. And, and as as they run, it generates new worlds. No, the bad part was they would run far as you go, and it once they got the generating night. new <coughs> area. Yeah, yeah, they would run until they get to like night, and then they would build a base. Yeah, build a sadness. Get home. it stable, <laughs> like so that way they had farms and everything there, and then start running again. Yeah, and uh, and just kept doing this. But like you said, every time you do that, it makes the world map larger. Yeah, every actually, time. I mapped it, takes it out too. Right? The... Well, what, one of the cool things is what I would do is I would interject inside of this. Um, there's mapping utilities too that you can take a Minecraft map and render it. And so I had a on the Google Maps style Minecraft wow. map of their world. And it looked like a giant star. Because <laughs> we all ran in separate directions. Yeah, that was my question. What if they all ran in different directions? I mean, we, we, did. Did. Giant star. Bigger. <laughs> we did. We did. It gets exponentially bigger. We did. We all ran in the memory Why of the server. Why were you doing this? Because we couldn't get along. <laughs> we all had different build styles. <laughs> we did, man. It's funny. It's like I remember, like, you had actually just started a new world, and then it was like me and Cammy and Bryn. <laughs> oh, no. And then it was so funny because like their playstyle was different from mine. And like there was one night like I was getting chased by a creeper. I remember I ran to open the door to go run inside. This guy's once yeah, you're inside, it loses sight of you. They put a tree stump on the inside of the door. Just so, they said supposedly so if you know, zombie breaks under your door, it can't go in. And I'm just like, 
Great, but I also just got killed by a creeper. Oh, by the way, tree stump's gone. <laughs> Along with that, wall. <laughs> and after that, like, there were like two or three things like that that happened. And I'm just like, I'm going this way and I'm building a fortress. <laughs> so, yeah, Minecraft fun at the hacker space. It was a good time. I really miss that place. Um, the server was great. I, yeah. I used to love the server. We, you just never know what you're walking back into when you logged into it. Ronnie right. might have chicken bombed the entire thing. You oh, know. no. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how you would do a Minecraft server. The next thing I want to show you is how you would do uh, use Steam to make a Steam server. Now there are a lot of different Steam servers that you can utilize. Uh, this is uh, an example of a TF2 uh, server. So uh, if you want to go and get it, make a TF2 server, right, or a Counter Strike server, or a, a Factorio server, or whatever, this is how you would do it. You just do it with a different app. Uh, number. So I made a directory called Steam, and then I downloaded the Steam command <coughs> uh from their site, uh, and then I just pass it login anonymous because I don't. It, you, this particular application uh, to make a server doesn't need a login. I tell it app update, and this is on their site. All the different things that you can do. Not very well on their site, but it's kind of hard to find stuff. Uh, but you do app update, and then this is the application number, and then you tell it to quit. And so what it does is it uh, Steam command takes these arguments and it says, oh, you want to update the TF2 application. It checks its own um, code to make sure the Steam command itself is up to date. If it's not, it updates itself and exits, so you run it again. And then it goes and it says, hey, is TF2 up to date? It checks it. If it's not updates it, if it doesn't exist, then it's very up, not up to date, and so it installs it. Um, and then it'll exit out when it's done. When it's done. Then, uh, when I want to start the TF2 server, I do my little screen trick again. Right? Screen, and I name it TF2. And so when I go into the server, I can type like screen-ls. And I can see all the different screen names that are running, and I know what they are. So naming your screen sessions is very important if you run a bunch of them. Um, and I do my little bash my C again and C to the home directory. The reason I do this is sometimes uh, programs look in a in a current working directory for material and goods. So if it has uh, particular SOs or uh, libraries or configuration files, a lot of times it expects them to be in a subdirectory of the directory they're starting from. And so a lot of times that's why I CD to a place instead of just running that from an absolute directory. So then I run my source <coughs> remote, I don't know, it's, 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 this is their Linux server name. Uh, I tell it to start a console. Uh, the game is Team Fortress. Uh, SV Pure means that if you join my server, it will actually check or it enforces the check of all of your games or, or all of your game files have to be um, at the match. correct. They have to match the servers, uh, which cuts down on cheating. Uh, so, like if you're DLL for you know the back end of the game, if you've modified that, and then like your client comes and says, "Well, here's my version of the DLL," and I'm like, "That doesn't match mine." <laughs> also, it checks player models and stuff like that too a lot of times, um, yeah. because there were player models where what it would do is it put a balls. giant arrow above your head mm -hmm. <laughs> that would go on for like a mile, but it would make it so you knew where everyone was in the map at any given time. Yeah, old game hacking was was amusing and how they did some things. Like uh, I remember uh, in Counter Strike a long time ago, was it? Uh, in Counter Strike a long time ago, there was a. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was. Um, I got my phone now. <laughs> uh, there was a um, there was a problem where you could change your clock, and so um, it's basically your tick rate. And so if somebody did that, they mm -hmm. like little script kitties would download a program. It would make them faster, and so they could just sprint to your spawn before everybody could even leave the spawn, and they just had a shotgun, and they were just pop, 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 pop. Yeah, they were just machine gunning with a shotgun. But as a server, back in the day at least, you could change things on the client without asking them. <laughs> and so you could just kill their game. You could set that to super slow. 
<laughs> you can also offer an update. You can also delete their game. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, the best one's you can offer them an update. Would you like a new DLO? <laughs> Let's so go with Spot a Reverse Shell. Oh, have you seen Rick and Morty? <laughs> I love Rick and Morty. I would like to see Rick and Morty inside of Modern Warfare 3 and have a survival match. Basically, where you're just like having the sun rising up and stuff like that, shooting hellfire missiles at you on the ground. And then after that, you can have like a giant Beth walking on top of you, possibly. <laughs> I just think that'd be pretty fun. I love Rick and Morty. It's a great show. Yeah. Morty Mike and Seth, he has Sherber down and stuff like that in this kind of a fashion that possibly I'm not very good with Sherbers yet. Oh, servers are great, but um, I don't know. It's you, like I'm getting there. It's like if you have questions, we have a mailing list. Yeah. And I mean, we are not the probably the fastest people at responding, but we have you know, a lot of people on. It, so. I asked a question today on the mailing list, and it's the first question that's been asked on the mailing list. I don't know how long. And I know. An that's why. I'm, and I got an answer back within a minute. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. So we're a bunch of PHP nerds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if nobody knows, you probably will just get crickets. <laughs> but, uh, you know, especially for, like, uh, new stuff or just, like, when you start down and everything, you're going to get, like, 30 different opinions on how to do it. And that's good because then, you you know, you have a lot of choice. <laughs> Uh, this is what I learned today. Uh, there is a uh, method of changing, kind of like said, in match. And so what I'll do is I'll just... This one was new to me too. I didn't even know that. And I read the man page. Apparently on this thing. So uh, what I did here is I, I, um, I made a variable called foo. And I gave it the... Uh, I gave it the value of old beer here, all right? And so if I echo dollar sign foo, which is how I get the variable um, value, it says old beer here, right? Well, I can manipulate that inside of bash. So I say echo dollar sign curly bracket foo. What that does is it calls foo, and it takes its value, and it replaces whatever's here with whatever's here. And so instead of old beer here, I have now cold beer here, which is nice. But it only does the first one. Now there's probably a way you can get it to manipulate it to do different ones, but by default, I say foo and I say er. So er is here and here, okay? And instead of er, it says old B, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition here. <laughs> so, it's not a black hammer reference. So, I didn't do the other one. Yeah, now, the question is on. can you add another yeah. slash at the end and a G and then it'll actually do the exactly. ER yeah. that occurred in here? Yeah. Um, slash G. Yeah. Let's see if that works. Nope. Nope. Yeah. So, uh, I'm sure that's. Some limitations there, but not that big. Of a well, I mean, it's. Uh, let's see, what is it called? I see it, I can remember, but it's a really long man page. <laughs> hey, on the parameters, I think. Let's just document it. Um, it wasn't an expansion, was it? I think it is, but if that's the case, I think you would pass it. Let's see, I got it in my chat log at work. <laughs> And how did you find this? Uh, my coworker actually. Uh, he was. Uh, I, would, I, I went over and asked him, like, "Hey, I'm trying to do this, and I'm thinking about using sad or cut. But would you? Is there a more interesting way, or some like way you would say is probably a good way of doing it?" He's like, "Oh, just do it with bash." And I'm like, "Huh? Tell me more." <laughs> and so he did, and it's amazing. Let's see. Actually, I think, uh, like this seems to be a, a new thing to just about everybody that I know. Yeah, I didn't know that one. That's new to me. Yeah, I, uh, he, he walked over and told me about it, so uh, it's in this man page. Uh, so <laughs> so again, it's not it's a long man page. So it's a, man page. a man page is a manual page. <laughs> and so, it, uh, there it is, per, parameter ex expansion. So there's all this parameter inspection, but then you can do these specialty things. Oh, I didn't know about the offsets either. That's yeah. kind of cool. And how do they miss this entire section? 
<laughs> There's this is the this is the really specialized stuff. So removing a prefix pattern, removing a suffix pattern, and then pattern substitution. Is there a way to global that? Perimeter is at or if the parameter if pattern is begins with slash, all matches of pattern are replaced with string. Uh, oh, the there you go. Sign. Almost at the bottom. If parameter is at or uh, Star. asterisk, the substitution is applied to each positional parameter in turn. So you can get both your here, your here, and your here. So, so star, star, no one inspects the, Oh, no, yeah, no. Or this, or? I think so. Slash after. It might be that slash G. Oh. No, I think you still got to have your slash in there. Slash asterisk ER. Well, that would be everything. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, That's a regex everything, so let's try to do that. I don't know, it's like we'll it, but, <laughs> but yeah, Bash has a lot of cool stuff in it. Any questions with mater that material? Very cool. Okay. okay. Moving on to containers. Woo. Okay, so I, uh, this is uh, one of my container updater scripts. Um, Hopefully there's not any passwords in there I have to change after this presentation. <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, there is one container that actually takes the passwords as arguments, and it's right here too. But, uh, so in here, I have, I'm setting up Motion Eye, Unify Controller, Smoke Ping, and Archive Team, and then uh, pruning the system and getting the Docker status. What's Motion Eye? Uh, Motion Eye is a camera watching system. So I have two cameras on my house. I have one in the uh, driveway and one at the front door. So it's looking for motion? Yeah. It's, it's literally motion in a container. <laughs> and it's got like a web front end and stuff like that. So it's a nice little thing. Very CPU intensive. <laughs> but I, I like having the cameras there because what I can do is I, I literally, in the back room of my house, I can't hear the doorbell mm. at all. And it's really annoying when somebody's like, I've been beating on your door for five minutes. Just text Dan. That's, right. that's what you do it if you Right, you have to call me. And so, like, uh, instead of that, if I'm expecting somebody or something, I can literally pull this web page up and watch both cameras without having to go to the camera or, like, fire up VLC or something like that. And you can set them up to have different zones and different parameters where it'll actually capture that. And so I have it capturing things with <coughs> particular parameters. Um, and then keeping them for a week and then it discards them or like whatever whatever time thing I have week a month something like that. Um, what's really cool about this, the reason I really like using Motion Eye personally, is yes, there's a lot of like you can go buy the Google camera or you can go buy the you know there's probably an Amazon camera I don't know. You're taking your data and giving it to them. Very personal data, especially if you have one inside of the house. Okay? This doesn't leave my house. Well, I mean, it, it gets backed up to my server out in a data center, mm -hmm. but it doesn't leave my possession other than on the internet and being encrypted through that. So, this allows you to uh, actually go and have camera software and, and and do stuff on my own without handing my data off, and also paying somebody to do that too. Hey Dan, so I've been thinking about doing the same thing. So, can you? Is there room to implement some kind of machine learning uh, algorithm on here on your server backend? Um, is, uh, have you Have you considered doing that, or have you started you, net you running? Oh, like facial recognition for say. He's talking about you know, actually doing oh, proper well, video. Right. This is just this is just a uh, this is just a motion detector yeah, out of the camera. Feed. Yeah, you could yeah. probably code something like that. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's uh, IP camera is an IP camera. Like you can literally as an IP camera, the, the, the right? I mean, yeah, video but, recorder, and you could just dump that output to something. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah. Your yeah. own motion yeah. eye uh, does not have that capability. Uh, you could maybe code a module for it and use the. It's an open source. It's an open source project. What What's it written in? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I'll I'll take a look. Uh, probably C. 
I was gonna do. I have a camera in my house. I was gonna play with. But, yeah. I mean, that's that's the that's the beauty of open source. If you're looking open, for open stuff, good place to get started. Check out OpenCV. Open what? Oh, OpenCV. Okay. Oh, check it's open tools. Camera Vision. It's There's Python. Oh, that's a there, no, actually beauty C, player. C, it's actually C, C with C, Python yeah. binding. Yeah. 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 Even open, better. Check open V. But that's, but that's that's Intel's uh, uh, image processing on top of OpenCV. Motion motion. Motion. Yeah. Motion. Speaking of which, uh, not related, has anyone here played around with comma AI the, the, in their the, car? The front end is written uh, in Python. I have a friend who's a bunch of comma stuff. I, my car's not capable, but I really want So, uh, for the containers themselves, uh, what I'm doing here is uh, Docker does this very interesting thing. If you want to update the container, what you have to do is destroy it and get a new copy and then reinstall it. And so if you just if I just did this top part and I put all the configuration, I like went into the container and did all the configuration and then I decided to update, guess what? I'm losing all of that. Right? So the way that Docker uh, suggests you do things is you export particular uh, stuff. Um, in this case, my config and my media are being exported outside of the container. Okay, so they're on the local file system. Well, they're actually on a remote file system on another server. But to it, it's basically a local file system. And so here I say, like, I want to update the server. I just run the script, and it goes through and does a 20. It stops the container, which I named the motion I. It then removes the container. It destroys it. And it pulls a new copy of the container. Okay, So uh, this is the person that made it. They have a, um, a Docker page. This is the project. And then this is the version. So I can actually say I want the specific version if I want to as well. Uh, which is also uh, helpful if you're trying to um, to work on a particular uh, version of Linux or a particular <coughs> version of a container or Apache or something, and you want to find exploits, or you want to like like you want to make sure that your company's uh, Docker containers for the Apaches are okay and are safe, but instead of just pulling latest, you pull that version. All right, then you can attack it and make sure that everything's okay with that version, and then later on when you update to another version, you should be like, I want to come to this version and do it like that and start stepping. You don't have to always take the latest one. Uh, but I'm just using it as <coughs> just using, so I just take the latest one. Uh, then I tell it to run, so I say docker run dash d is daemon, hostname motioni, so I can call it by that hostname. Well, actually, that's the internal hostname. Name motioni is what names it in the docker container. Restart unless stopped. You know, there's a couple of different options you can do. But basically, restarting, uh, let's say I restart the computer, the, the server. Docker has a daemon that comes up, and then it brings up the containers, if you have that uh, set up properly. Uh, so if you don't have uh, the restart set up, which might be why my smoke thing doesn't come up. Uh, yeah, that's, I, I've had problems with my smoke thing. Notice that there's no restart option in there. So I restart the computer. Smoking doesn't come back uh, because it's not configured to. Um, then we have the dash p, and the dash p is your port, and so you're forwarding ports. Uh, Docker has isolated networks, and so every time you spawn a machine, it spawns inside of a Docker container network. It doesn't just take whatever ports from the server it, it wants, and you can also do like a lot of manipulation and stuff. Um, for for instance, this Unify one. I have uh, my internal, I, I, made, I spawned another IP because it was, this particular container is very uh, unhappy if it doesn't get the ports that it wants. Uh, and so I went ahead and spawned another IP on my Linux box on the same port. You can have as many IPs on a port as you want. Um, and so I spawned another IP and then I handed it all the ports that it wants. And it gets its own IP and everything. Um, so you can just either specify it here, and it just takes the default, or you can specify a specific interface. Uh, then E is um, basically an option. It's like O and most of the other programs. I don't know why they use E. Uh, but uh, TZ, time zone, 
PUID, PGID, or I'm specifying a specific unit, UID and GID. Docker runs as root. You do execution with Docker with root. If you don't do that, the process runs as root. I don't like that. I'm not okay with that. So all of them have a very stunted user that doesn't have permissions to do much of anything on the box. Um, then my V are um, bindings to internal and external uh, file systems. And so here I say uh, I want to go to this. This is a network address, and I want it bound into this. So inside of the container, home, nobody, media, <coughs> gets bound to this external address. Same thing here. Slash config inside of it gets bound to this, this uh, local address. And then I tell it, again, the same thing we did up there. I want this code base, this product, this version to run. Okay? And I basically did that over and over again with different ones. So we have Motion Eye, which is a motion capture thing for IP cameras. We have Unify Controller, which is um, uh, that's Unif Unify is a company that makes network products, so they have like access points and switches and hardware and uh, like uh, routers and all kinds of stuff. And Unify Controller is a piece of software that basically associates all that. And so you can just, uh, it is a giant pain in the butt to set up. And let me tell you what, Docker, for that kind of types of products, great. And guess what? You can do a lamp stack in it. Uh, <laughs> uh, <coughs> smoke ping, smoke ping. I know all of you yeah, live in Jacksonville. This, this was a cool one. Yeah, I know all of you live in Jacksonville. And uh, we have two choices in the internet usually. We have Chromecast and the Death Star at and <laughs> And they're both huh. terrible. <laughs> the fun thing about it is they, you can call them up and be like, hey, my internet's messed up. And be like, yeah, I'm losing like 2% loss on my pay or something. And they're just like, did you try to restart it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> did you try to unplug it? Are you plugged directly into it? Is your house on fire? You know, this, like, they, they, they make all these internet excuses, but. I, I have Comcast business at my house because I work from home sometimes and I need to have a higher level of service. If I go down, I have to go to the office or like do something like that. And it's very irritating uh, to do that at 3 a.m. when somebody calls me and I'm like, hold on, let me drive somewhere. <laughs> uh, also, my uh, the, the cell signal in my house area is bad and so my internet is partially my cell signal. So I need to have that for like when I'm on call and different things like that. And so having a solid internet connection is very important to not only just because I'm an internet person, but my job. And um, I was having loss issues. It would happen after rainstorms and all this kind of stuff. But I would just call them up. And instead of sitting there having like, okay, well, on my router server, I'm pinging uh, now, on their site, they say, do not ping outside of, like you can test with ping, but ping like Comcast DNS or Comcast website, stuff on their network, which makes sense in a network troubleshooting thing. You want to do something inside of their network. When I was talking to the business people, they were saying, ping Google. Why? Because it just ping Google. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another good target if you're trying to figure out if something's having a problem, uh, ping 1.1.1.1. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great target. Yeah. What um, is it? Cloudflare. Cloudflare. Yeah, Cloudflare's DNS server. Yeah, it's one 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 one. Uh, it's the and then they, on the keyboard. Yeah, they uh, they encourage you to basically DDoS it. <laughs> but uh, they wanted they, for a long time they wanted to see how much traffic they could generate, <laughs> just because they're crazy. I, don't know. I like those guys. Um, but uh, with this tool, you can actually set up. Um, pinging targets and track them and it will make RRD graphs which are round robin database graphs and it'll show you your loss, it'll show you your ping times, so it'll show you all the different stuff and then I can just be like, hey Comcast, what? Fix your stuff. What's wrong with it? Well, I can't, like these routes are messed up, these routes are messed up, I, I'm pinging my router or what's well, running on the router so it's, I'm pinging um, 
I'm pinging the modem, I'm getting no loss, and then I'm pinging the first hop, and that's no loss, and then I'm pinging the second hop, and then I'm getting like 30% loss. Might be a problem, right? So you can help identify problems with using a tool like this, and it's free. Um, one thing that you have to know about uh, troubleshooting networks, by the way, ping is not the de facto, like, end all, this is having a problem. If you ping a target, well, one, uh, you can use like um, MTR, which is my trace route, and it'll sit there and ping each hop between you and the target. Uh, it's actually really cool. So if I do MTR, oh, my name's Dan Bottleman. <laughs> I've I, I, yeah, I actually didn't do the uh, uh, introduction. My name is Dan Bottleman. I'm the president of the log. My favorite Linux right now is Gentoo. Uh, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, and so if I do mtr google.com, oh, it's got a GUI. Cute. I don't want the GUI. Thank you. Curses. Curses. All right. So this is MTR. I'm pinging <coughs> Google.com. This is where Google.com is for our local. Uh, Repeatedly, uh, apparently. Yes. This is actually uh, the, the, the one that I like. And you can actually do a lot of configuration with this. But um, it'll show you your whole route out. Um, sorry that I'm showing their public IP. Uh, <laughs> But uh, basically, it shows your route out, it pings all the targets, all this kind of stuff. Now, you will see loss on hops going to your target. And a lot of people are like, there's the culprit. Not necessarily. Certain routers can actually prioritize different types of packets. And if they start getting low on resource, like they're starting the bottleneck or anything like that, they'll start dropping things that are not high priority, such as ICMP packets, which is ping. All right, so if you're pinging your local uh, Comcast route that's for like your southeast region or something, and you're getting 30% loss there, but you're getting like 0.5% loss to something behind it, it's probably not a problem. Can you switch it over to TCP or UDP by chance? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. you can. Okay. I think I, I'm pretty sure you can. Um, Uh, you can do IPv4, IPv6. Um, yeah, there's TCP, UDP. Okay, cool. So uh, you might be able to do that. To you could do. You could change your uh, bit your, your TOS. <laughs> you can mark things. You can do grace periods. There's all kinds of cool stuff. There. So, yeah, lots of neat things. You can change your packet size. You can do it for a particular account. You can change your TTLs. Yeah. So your first TTL, but you can actually make it so you can get past the first few hops uh -huh. without being noticed. Yeah. Um, and well, that's could, the way the trace route works. Is what it does is it sets the TTL to one, and what it does is every time it goes through a hop, it deincrements that, and when it gets to zero, that host will reply and let you know it died. So what you do is you set it to one, and that first hop, it's going to reply and say, yeah, "Okay, I got the packet, but it died." Now you know that host responded to you. <coughs> Next route, you set the TTL to two, it gets past that first hop, goes to the second one, then dies, and you get the response. That's how it's actually identifying the route. That's cool, I didn't actually know how that worked. That's yeah. pretty neat. That's but that's good. why it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be ICMP, it can be TCP or UDP, because they both have TTL. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, so yeah, there's lots of cool stuff. Apparently it has a web interface, yeah. or a, uh, not a web interface, but a, a GUI interface. It's got GTK and no, because that's part of the So it's got a GUI and a TUI. Yeah. So, um, what I, what I did when I was troubleshooting things, things yeah. is I was actually doing reports. And so it it I had a cron job with this, and I told her, I'd like you to do this a thousand times, generate a report, and dump it into a file in time there's no. And do that every hour. And so then right. I could just go and take that and then look at that report and see what was going on on that hour. And then I could help identify an issue if it's time based or like different areas and whatnot. So it's a cool little person. Prioritization, drive out, and go, okay.
Do you have any questions on yeah. Docker or MTR or Motion Eye or Unify yes. or Smoke Paint? Yes. Oh, uh, I'll talk about Archive Team too, but yes. On your Docker stuff, uh -huh. when you, do you notice, did you notice any difference when you ran it as a lower user versus root in regards to SE Linux? Uh, I'm running Docker itself, like the actual daemon and um, the commands as root. The, com the container the itself right. starts, it spawns a process as a lower user. Um, so, I don't know about so no, any no issues with, with SE Linux or? I don't know. Okay. I, don't I, know. Couldn't, I couldn't tell. Okay. Yeah. Yes? In, in Docker is it a, it's just running an application within a closed area. It's not running a virtual machine itself, is it? It's no, no. It's it's running an application inside of uh, what's called a container. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically a walled off area that's it's running on the host machine. Like a, a VM's running on the host machine. It's a process sitting inside of a host machine. That's why you can exploit VMs. You can exploit containers too, but there's code to stop you from doing that. Right. And so it's it's very efficient compared to VMs because your overhead's much, much lower. Uh, if I'm running an Apache instance versus a VM with an Apache instance, my VM is going to be bottoming out at like 256 megs of memory. And probably I want to have at least 512. And then you want Apache on top of that. So then you're going to add another 256 or 512 on top of that. So you may be doubling or tripling your memory load for running the VMs. And then you have a whole stack you have to keep it updated, you have to do a lot of things uh, to keep that running healthily and fast. Whereas containers is, it's, uh, there's a bunch of different container technologies. There's ones in um, there's Solaris are called Zones. Um, so they might, zones might be the VM stuff. It's been a long time since I've played with that stuff. But Solaris has them, uh, BSD has them. Uh, now Linux has them with Docker. There's a couple of different technologies inside of Linux that have um, both VM and container stuff. Does it compare to CH root? Uh, CH root is is not the same thing. CH root is where you are inheriting somebody's environment by going in there and then saying, "Look, I'm part of like this is my root directory. I'm going to inherit like your develop or your dev, your proc, your you know your file systems, all your different things, and so like." Uh, CH root is, in my case, at least mostly used for rescue. So the box goes down, uh, your uh, grub is corrupt or grub's broken in some way, and if I use this the key, then it'd be installing a different version of grub potentially than the system has, and that could not work. And so I would boot the key mount the root file system, ch root in the fi root file system, and then do my grub install. And that way I'm using the, the grub that is on that system uh, to do all of its different things. And you would want to do the same thing if you're trying to update something or install a package and you're in a broken state. You would want to do a ch root to get in there and do stuff like you were, quote, on the system. And it's broken. Also gets used a lot by embedded developers. You can emulate the file system that you're building, mm. and then when you're done with that, you can exit that and then build a root file system off of that. But while you're doing your development, you can ch root into it, and that way it does, there's no chance of the library was on my system, but it wasn't actually on the file system. Mm. It's going to go onto the embedded device, right? So and it gets used there a lot. That's, well. That makes sense, and that keeps it slim too, so you can know exactly what's going on. Yeah, yeah. So you don't have any of your own tools. You have to use what's on the file system. You know exactly what's there. You're not, not going to be missing dependencies because they are on your actual desktop, but not this file system. I, I mean, it kind of sounds like CH3 is kind of a container. I'm, I'm not certain what to call it. Uh, it kind of acts like a container a little bit. <laughs> well, um, the name pretty much says it all. Change root. Yeah. You're just changing the root of your file system to the root that you specified. Right. But you can't escape unless you see a root, you're logged in to that. Right. You can't. Jump back to the other system without yeah. exiting. That's why I'm saying it like, kind of acts like a container. But I don't know if you can see, like, I haven't gone into a CH root and then tried to see if I can see the processes of the host operating system. I don't know. I, no, well, it's, you can 
link, I think, the slash proc, and then that will allow you to get into like C oh. post. But yeah. that's optional. It's yeah. Optional. Well, when so, when you build a Gentoo system, yeah, you have to see it through. Yeah. yeah. And you you <coughs> pull in the dev, uh, the proc, all that kind of stuff, yeah. and that I guess. But that's control. optional, right? That's not a part of C yeah. through. So you can log in, so you don't yeah. get to see the process, uh, the devices, and stuff like that. So. Right. Right. Uh, and your proc file system is where the kernel handles like all of its processes, its mm -hmm. file. Uh, it's basically your your interface to the kernel. Uh, you can see what's going on inside of it. So like if I go to uh, cd slash proc, all these numbers are my processes. The PIDs. Yeah. And so I can go like 6088. And I don't actually know what that is, but uh, here's all the different... Here's all the different things that are happening in that. And if I say, all right, so what's my CWD? Or, uh, <laughs> you have to own that process for you to look at that. A root. Okay. <laughs> you own it. Oh. <laughs> Carry on. You can always say it's a link. And so it's actually Docker. Yeah. It's, one, it's one of the Docker processes. And so I can, this is great for mm -hmm. if you're doing system administration, you're trying to figure out something mm -hmm. wrong. And let's say that for some reason somebody's manipulated your PS command. And you want to find out what that process is. Well, guess what? <coughs> Proc don't lie. It is a direct interface to the kernel. And if it's there, it's in the kernel. I'm Ooh. sorry, what's the directory there? Slash proc. Uh, just, slash PRC. Just, just slash proc. PROC yeah. right off the root. Right yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it is a oh, what's wow. called what's known as a pseudo file system. All Linuxes have it that are more modern than probably 2002. Um, so it just creates a directory for every process. It creates it on boot. Yes. You are so awesome. Man. <laughs> this is also where you can see a lot of specs of the machine. Like this is where you see your CPU info, your mem info, uh -huh. so uh, your go. devices. A lot of their drivers have configuration options that go here. Right. So yeah, you have the uh, like CPU info. So if I cat that, or even better, if you watch it, watch cat that. Watch you know, it. Oh watch, well, yeah. Well, watch will well, update. Every right, two but your seconds. CPU. Yeah, your CPU info change. is not changing unless. Oh, like that's that. that's <laughs> the megahertz might actually. If yeah, you're I, I, power that's settings. true. Yeah, I thought you were looking at the. Well, I've and specified I've just the, um, the 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 percentage used or the workload. And then the temperatures. Yeah, you can get those out of the zones. Yeah, the, didn't, might set up. <laughs> didn't they have one called status? Would that be something to watch? Capitalization. Dash <laughs> <laughs> I. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, that the middle one should have got it. Yeah. It's probably the pipe, uh, pipe and watch. Yeah. Have weird things that play together. Yeah. yeah. So I probably just have to escape that, or tell it that's the one. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So there, now I'm watching my. So every two seconds, and you can change. This is this is a command called watch. It does whatever you're trying to do every two seconds, but you can't actually change that too. So it's telling you every two seconds it's running cat CPU info pipe grep minus i, which is uh, case insensitive MHZ. So it cats that file, it looks for MHC, and it, it gives you there. And so you can actually see my CPU kind of bouncing up and down as it's using up more and less power. Checks it every, every two seconds. In PROC, I believe that there is a trick that if there is a command running that does not give you output, and I think I used this on DD, mm -hmm. if you have the PID of what DD is doing, you can go into PROC and watch what it's up to. Uh, you can see a lot of stuff with PROC. So let's go back to our 6088. And I think you can cat stat. That's a lot of, uh, I, you'd have to look up what each one of those numbers means, but those are yeah. like the statistics on it. You can look yeah. at status. Status gives you like all the memory statistics and stuff. Yeah. Right now this guy is uh, sleeping. This isn't the whole name probably, so it's probably truncating that. Um, it gives you the mask, the IDs, the PID, the parents PID. Um, you can see that this this one's particularly running as root, uh, so it's probably like the, one of the main Docker processes. Um, your your virtual memory sizes. So like, if you use a 
If you use a command on Linux that provides you with information about the system, it's probably going to the proc file system, pulling that information out of the proc file system and handing it to you in a human readable way. So that's what proc is. It's great, um, super useful. It is a um, lower level uh, than most people see usually, but. Uh, we're all here to learn and have fun. So go play <laughs> around, make a VM, and go screw around inside of it. Break stuff. In, in Docker, are you using your kernel, or, the, or can you put a different kernel in the in your your Docker container? Uh, it's, it's running off of your kernel. Your kernel. It's so, not a VM. Yeah, that's the difference between a VM. Right. Containers not, are provided mm -hmm. by the kernel. Yeah. Yes, sir. So which means that if your kernel changes, your Dockers are going to go uh, well, if your kernel changes while your machine's running, yeah, like you're, you're running something very <laughs> fancy, <laughs> then you that's, that's, that's no download by Oracle, yeah, yeah, or yeah, you, you do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, are you, as a new user for Docker, would I be getting pre-built containers and running them in Docker? Yes. Or yes. would I be able to build my own containers? Uh, is that more advanced? Both. You can do either one. It is more advanced to build your own. But I have never built my own personally, but... Um, if you just go to Docker and what are these things? Get a real search engine. I've heard of Docker have a phone. DuckDuckGo is a real search engine. DuckDuckGo is a fast. Alright, so Docker Hub. So I want to, you know, there's how to install it, all that kind of stuff. And then you can go to, um, there's like people off of GitHub that do this. Docker Hub. Nginx, why not? Why not There's one. So this is, uh, I'm sorry, this is good. Let's grab one of the ones I'm using right now. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And you trust those containers? I mean, you're I, you trust them just as much as you trust Linux. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. It's open source. Uh, Linux usually has a lot more, um, Kind of cloud behind it and like uh, enforced. Uh, okay, so so let's say the kernel, right? It's open source. Sorry, I was just you can literally put anything you want into it. Now you can't download that off, that off of kernel.org, but you can make your own. You can put code in there if you want. There's somebody that actually watches the kernel, and they're the bastion of what goes into it. That's Linus, Linus and the Kernel Foundation. Linux has similar things, like there's the Debian Foundation. They're, they control what's going on in it. But inside of that foundation, there's package maintainers. And the package maintainers just go to, like, like go to GitHub, and somebody makes a piece of code, and somebody wanted that inside of Debian. And so what they do is they go to the GitHub page, and they say, OK, it compiles here. It compiles on these different platforms. I compile it for these devs, and then I push it into the Debian package repository. That does not mean that's not malicious. That just means that the package maintainer says that it works. Yeah. And so... Uh, especially when you're talking about dependencies and dependencies and dependencies, and one of those gets called. The, um, yeah, that sort of stuff happens, but luckily too, especially if you're dealing with like server environment stuff, you do end up with a lot of paranoid security people. Mm -hmm. They do end up looking over this stuff. Yeah. And they, All, oh, go, go ahead. They'll spot stuff like this. Like, it didn't take long, like... Um, one of the FTP servers that ended up in the Ubuntu repo actually got backdoored at a code level. Well, it didn't actually take long for people to figure that out because there was like one guy that decided to download the new version of it and diff it and figure out what the difference was. And it's like, wait, this is a macro that builds a backdoor, so if you put a smiley face in your username, it opens up a port with a root shell. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> And then he reported it through the mailing list, and ta-da, we now know that back door was there. And it's like, everybody either revert or wait for that new update to come and update immediately. Well, also, like, um, either open source or regular code, uh, like regular corporate code, we're all human. Uh, we're we're going to make mistakes. Uh, sometimes it's malicious, but most of the time it's not. Uh, people that code and make cool stuff are usually very passionate about that. They want to make something that works well, that doesn't break. Um, and so they look at their 
their GitHub page, people were like, hey, I got a bug, I did this, and it blew up, and they're like, oh, okay, we can try to figure that out. And so most people are really cool about it, but you end up sometimes with things like the SSH bug, like Heartbleed, or, oh no, that was a... SSL. That was SSL, but... That, I mean, certain things like that, that comes from PSD, or comes from the Debian package of it, and then everybody else uses that. And that's not that's just an open source thing. It's not, I mean, that, that, don't have, that happens in Microsoft, that happens in Macs, it happens in uh, all the different softwares and everything you put on it. And so, like, you see a kind of a movement of people doing, like, walk wall gardens where, like, um, Macintosh will not allow you to install things, Microsoft won't allow you to install things that aren't signed by their keys, but sometimes people can steal the keys. Um, yeah. And, so, like, but at least yeah. with open source, you've got well, the entire world looking at it. Yeah. Well, you okay, have, and you you have like, maybe somewhat more people looking at it. You well, can I mean, how many times, like, you, there's been malware planted into a code repo and it stayed there for a while. Yeah, like, it's open source as an idea is fantastic. Uh, open source as a practice um, really needs people to step up and look at things and, and communicate and, and present. Like my, the way that I give back to communities, I help run the organizations and you know show people how cool stuff is. I'm not a huge coder or anything, but like if you're really into coding, go join a project. Like go join one of the foundations, like the, the Gen Two Foundation, the Debian Foundation. GitHub, go like find one of the projects that you like, you really like, and just be like, hey, I found like go through the bug list and be like, hey, there's this bug with this program. This guy's not hasn't updated it yet. I know. Let me go. It. Let me go suggest a fix, and give them a piece of code that will fix it and attach it to the bug. Um, that's how the open source community uh, gets helped. But it doesn't guarantee security. You you need if you're that worried about that security, then you need to look at it. Um, otherwise, a lot of things you're just kind of doing the trust. I'm, I'm going to trust that this is probably okay. So uh, the last thing I'll talk because we're we're getting kind of long in the tooth here. I, I could talk you guys ears off. <laughs> I could talk. To, I could talk till I can't talk anymore. I'll be honest. As an improvised presentation, this has been great. Very yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you very much. So this is the very last thing, and we'll we'll release everybody. We release the house to the lush. Um, so I uh, I really enjoy the idea of the Internet Archive. Uh, the Internet Archive basically uh, suggests that the Internet is like books. It's a culmination of information that's valuable. And like think GeoCities. Like people made, I made a site, when I was a kid I made a site on GeoCities. It's probably on the Internet uh, Archive. That's and I can go look it up. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I learned how to code HTML in it. I would actually like to go back and look at what I did. But in the day and age of um, basically digital death, like where things just sit out forever and then eventually expire, not only do you have a lot of security issues with that, where like, hey, I spun up a server, and then it got hacked, and so I just said, eh, and then I deleted it, right? Well, all the information that was there, it's gone. Internet Archive try to basically make a backup to the internet. And they're really good at it. And um, there's some, I forgot the guy's name. Jason Scott. Jason Scott. That guy is awesome. And uh, they call him the angel of death because if he shows up at your... Uh, uh, if he shows up at your server, it's not good. Yeah, if he shows up at your business, you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> and uh, so one, one of the ones was, um, uh, one, you can run in Docker or in a VM what's called the Archive Team Warrior, which I, I think is a great thing. And so what it does is it, it goes out and it uses curl, which is a command line um, program that will download some, uh, like a web page. It uses curl to go fetch web pages. And so they have jobs. And the job, they say, hey, this site's going down. Send the Archive Team Warriors. And so there's this basically this giant cloud of people that are just handing their resources off via VMs or uh, Docker containers or building their own. Um, and they send a job out and it says, hey, you know, you're allocated this list. And your machine will go hit each one of the sites, archive it, bundle it up, and then send it to the Internet Archive to help them uh, basically manage the material. It's funny the way that Jason Scott actually describes it. You're running a VM that has a bot in it. They can basically set up jobs and send it out to the botnet. 
and then you do what's known as a preservation of service attack against the web server, where you swiftly request as much of the site as you can. Because it's funny, like what he was actually saying is the biggest problem for the internet, and the reason why Internet Archive is very important is what's known as AccuHires, which is where I am a big company, I'm buying this small company out, and this small company has been letting people like upload their photos to it. Mm, yeah. And all of a sudden we went, well, this has also been a small little run gig, they didn't even have a legal counsel. There could be all sorts of bad stuff on here that could be a legal liability to us. So what we're going to do is we're going to tank this thing and make it go away while we got the little bit of intellectual property that we wanted from this company. I'm scared of what's on that server. I don't know what's there. I'm going to give it a Viking funeral and send it out into the ocean. And we're going to be done with this. We wipe our hands with the liability. Mm -hmm. That ends up happening a lot. And a lot of times they'll be like, all right, well, when they send out that little blog two post weeks. that says, in two weeks, we're shutting down the service. Back up everything that you need, because it's going yeah. away permanently. Yeah, this is like people's photos of their mothers. Yeah, it's a cloud service you've been uploading your... Yeah. Pictures of your kid too, and these are the only pictures of your baby that you have. Right. And, and then they're like, yeah, no, it's permanently deleted after two weeks. And what they'll do is they'll take people that are on this archive team warrior. They will figure out what they need to do to collect the data off the server and how to do the scripts and stuff like that. And then after they've got that set up, they kick it up to the archive team. And then basically all these bots mm -hmm. basically start connecting to their servers and downloading everything. So my, my favorite thing is, one, you can watch these. And so you can set it, like, I want a specific project. And you can be like, like they'll list the projects that they're working on, and you'll be like, I want that one. And it'll only do that one. So you don't have to be like, oh, you know, I don't want to go to some site or something. You can be like, I want this specific one, that's fine. Or you can just set it to auto. And it's just, whatever is the highest priority right now, it goes for it. And so when Twitter decided to ban all of its porn, or not Twitter, Tumblr. 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 But Tumblr, Tumblr decided to ban all its porn. I think I'm probably on a list at this point. I spent about <laughs> two or three weeks, and it was like all kinds of really rancy stuff. And it was like, all right, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had six things going out and downloading Tumblr porn <laughs> for like two and a half, three weeks. And then large swaths of the internet got banned from Tumblr because they, we, the archive team was it's a preservation of service. denial of service. And so, and Tumblr didn't want people to have the material. So they're just like, you gotta get your stuff out. Oh, Jesus. Uh, you can't have it. It's funny, yeah. if you watch his videos, he will actually say that he's done this enough where it's actually caused denial of service conditions for websites. Mm -hmm. And he's actually managed to either A, have them negotiate extending their deadline for downloading the content. So that way he's like, look, if you give us more time, we don't have to slam your server so hard. Uh, he's like, or you can give us backdoor access to the database and the file server and we can just download it directly and it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. But if we have to crawl your website to figure out what's out there, it gets pretty hairy. <laughs> and they do it. <laughs> and they do it. They yeah. absolutely do. They'll have like some people that are literally, you're not even downloading anything, you're just going to spider the site and find content to re report it. So let's uh, continue this conversation at the Lush. Uh, just suffice to say, Docker is a container system. It allows you to uh, make things uh, very easily on a system, maintain them fairly easily, but also as a very big bonus, it allows you to do things that are extraordinarily complex. Easy. So it's got downfalls and upfalls over there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan.